Hi there folks. Talking today about Jason Data Improvements of MySQL 8.0. Uh, there's a lot that happened with 8.0 from 5.7. A lot of it was internal improvements that made a lot of the behind the scenes functions a lot better. I'm gonna talk about the stuff that really impressed me when I started playing with 8.0. Now, the JSON data type was introduced in 5.7, as I mentioned, and they did a lot of work to get it improved for 8.0. Now, chief among these changes was the introduction of JSON table, which you'll see later and some of the stuff for JSON validation. Also, uh, you also gain the ability uh, that's for validation. So let's talk about what's gonna be covered in this session. There we go. Uh, about me, I'm a technology evangelist at Percona, a long time open source advocate. I am an author of a book on MySQL and JSON, which is now in the second edition. Now, traditional relational databases featured normalized data. This is where you broke down everything into logical parts for consumption. Uh, it's usually put into uh, tables and you get nice operators like joints to be able to take the things like, like a customer ID and put it to a shipping address and link it to another table for shipping. And part of this is strict data types that let you have some rigor on your data. Uh, it's easier to keep bad data out than to fix it later. And as you might have heard earlier, you have to make decisions up front on what your data is going to look like. Now, the NoSQL JSON databases, their big feature is they're freeform and flexible. Data is usually stored in a key value pair. There's no rigor on the data. There's many different formats. You could have different formats in the same schema. And there's no decisions on the data until output. Roughly about 10 years ago, we were told that the NoSQL databases were gonna kill off the relational databases because of all the problems with structured query language in the model. Also, they decided that they were gonna do all sorts of relational type tricks like uh, transactions, and they somewhat succeeded. While all that was going on, the relational database, database vendors came out and added JSON support, which kind of undercut the legs for a lot of the NoSQL world. So what is JSON? Well, it's the data interchange format of choice for most developers out there. Uh, it started off as JavaScript object notation, very human readable, very easy to write, and as I mentioned, it's the standard for interchange. Now developers tend to see the world like things on the left, where you have key value pairs, where you have, where you have a key of ID and a value of one, two, three, four, five. You can have strings, you can have numerics, you can have arrays. The arrays can be numerics, they can be strings, they can be a mix. It's all very loosey-goosey. And then on the right, you have a table definition, which is the way DBAs normally see data, where you have a ID field and the characteristics of that field. In this case, it's a car 100 and not null. So relational model. Uh, for those of you who do not know this man, he wrote a seminal paper in the early 70s that's still a vital reading. His name is Edgar Codd. He worked for IBM. And he came up with the idea of structured query language. And unfortunately for him working for IBM, IBM didn't like it, but there's another company around here called Relational Something or Other started by a guy named Larry Ellison who uh, took his work and really ran with it. So what is structured query language? Well, it's the only programming language from the 1970s still heavily, still heavily used. Hopefully there's no prologue users out there. It introduced the concept of accessing many records with a single command. Previously, you read, read, read until you get an end to file mark. Data is divided up into logical groupings like customer information, product information, order information, that way. And originally it was designed to minimize du disk or data duplication. Disk drives were very slow and expensive in the 1970s and 80s. And it was particularly useful in handling structured data, i.e. Uh, the relationships between the various tables. So why didn't JSON document databases replace relational systems? Whoops. I had an animation there. Well, basically what happened is people realized the relational model has a lot to give. Sure, it's been around for 50 years, but it really is useful in most business settings. Also, a lot of the drawbacks of the document database is that you couldn't have rigor on your data. And you'll see what I mean by that. So here's a quick little quiz. We created a table called Q2. It has a column of type JSON. 
and we're going to insert some information into the, the uh, table. Now, if you notice, we have a JSON document there that has three key value pairs. One's an uppercase A for the key, another uppercase A, and yet another third uppercase A. What is the value in that table? Well, in this case, the last one wins. Oops, that zipped by a little fast. So this slide got reordered. I'm sorry, I did this in, uh, in Google Slides and it didn't come through. So UTF-8 is, UTF-8, JSON is all UTF-8 MB4. Uh, to add new fields, you just add it to your document. It doesn't matter, you don't have to go back and fix the other documents. It's easy to duplicate documents or data in the documents. Also have duplicate of your records. You can nest objects almost to absurd levels. It's not really consistent, but there's some ways to do that. But in the upper right hand corner, you'll see my big uh, grumble, no rigor applied to data. I'm running a record, I want to record the email as E-M-A-I-L, all lowercase. Someone else wants to camel case it, someone wants to the dash. Uh, someone's doing other variations of that. And uh, there's no way to make sure that it's there the way you want it by itself. It's also very easy to abandon old data. Like you're recording emails today, next week you forget to do it, and sometime later you come back and say, oh, we need to go back and get emails. Well, the records that are already in there, you may not be able to go back and recover that data. A lot of agile developers are very upset when I tell them that agile methodology does not usually work with databases. It has a lot of uh, holes. Databases you want stable, you want them fairly fixed. Uh, agile folks want to be able to do things on a moment's notice and change. So one of the things you have to ask yourself, what is your biggest priority? Development ease or using the data? So as I mentioned earlier, JSON was added to MySQL back in 5.7, which is 2015. The data is stored as a binary blob. It's stored, sorted by key, and you got about a one gigabyte payload. If you need more than that, have two columns of the JSON data type. Now, before the JSON data type was around, we were storing JSON documents out there as a big string. It worked. Uh, it was messy. If you wanted to search things, you end up writing very nasty regex expressions. Uh, it's very hard just to extract easily one component of the string. You had to read the entire string. And if you had to rewrite just one, process, one part of the string, you had to do it all. Not very efficient. Now, here's an example of a table called ATO. It has an ID that's an integer and a column called data that's JSON. I insert into that call thing a JSON document with the key of uh, of name and the value of Dave and the key of answer and the value of 42. And, ooh, that's a little different than what I thought it would be. So when I do the, oops, let me go back. So when I so do the select, it comes back as you see the two columns there. Now, if I use one of the operators that comes with, with the JSON data type, the dash double arrow, and I give it the path, dollar sign means the, the start of the path, and the key name that I want, it will go out there and pull out that exact value for me. Now, one thing that's kind of confusing for a lot of folks that have started playing with JSON off the bat is the single arrow operator versus the double-headed arrow operator. The double-headed arrow operator strips off the S from the value. Let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, uh, no, darn. So, JSON functions. Now, as you can imagine, um, with 8.0, there was a whole bunch of new functions added. And this is in section 12.18.1 of the manual. I know that's hard to read, but this gives you an idea of the various things out there where you can go out there and get the type of uh, value of the document. There's a pretty printer. Uh, there's things for merging various documents together, uh, for extracting parts of a document. Uh, appending arrays, getting rid of arrays, a whole bunch of really useful functions. Unfortunately, I only have 25 minutes, and if you really want to know this, my manual, the manual or my book, where are you going to go? So you have this JSON data, but you need to use it in a non-JSON way. Now, as Nikolai pointed out earlier, you can use a generated column. This extracts 
a value from the JSON document and turns it into its own column, a materialized column. Now in this example, uh, we're altering a table to add a column that's generated always, and we're designating that is that we're gonna take anything in the data, co data column that starts with name for the, for the key, and we're gonna put that as its own special column, and it's gonna fit into a car 25. This works very well. As Nikolai said earlier, if you want performance, change your application to put this in there directly into its own column. Anytime you do something behind the scenes, like a generated column where it's extracting for you, it slows things down. This is something that came out about two years ago with MySQL, multi-valued indexes. Before this, you had a correlation, one ent entry in an index, one entry in a, in a row. Now, with JSON being able to store arrays, it's very handy to be able to index each item in the array. So, and when you use a multi-value index, there's just special operators. In this case, we're gonna use the member of operator. So we're gonna say anytime the number seven is a member of that co column called J, we're gonna return those records. Now the other functions that came with this are JSON contains and JSON overlap. So there are ways to check what numbers are within a range and what there's overlap within a range. Now this is the, the feature that I really love, JSON table. It takes your unstructured JSON data and temporarily makes it a structured table. Now the generated column permanently makes it a structure, piece of the structured data this temporarily does it, and then you can run it through CTEs, window functions, whatever you want to do to process your data. Now, it's kind of funky to, to learn how to do this. The basic call is JSON table. And then within there, you say, okay, the columns I want you to pull out. And in this example, you'll see that we're going to take the name column, that's the dollar sign name, we're going to cast it as a car 20 and call it country name. And likewise, we're doing the same thing for independence year. We're gonna call it indie year and turn it into an integer. And once we have that, we can run it through the normal SQL uh, features like you're used to. In this case, we're just doing a simple where independence years go to 1992. Very, very handy. Now, the other handy bit about this is that if you have missing values in your JSON data, you can uh, force a default value. Or if there's errors, you can uh, force values. Now in this example, we're pulling out some information from the, uh, from a table, uh, from city two, which is a variation of the old city table from the world database. And in this case, we're gonna say, hey, if we don't have a value, the default value is gonna be 999. If we do have an empty value, we're gonna put in 987. And as you can see, the first entry, alpha, the population is 100, so it comes out as population 100. Second value comes out, the name is beta, and the value instead of being an integer is fish. So we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna default to 999. Now on the last one, you'll see there that we have a null instead of a uh, value. And in this case, we're gonna put in the value 987. So using JSON data, JSON table, if you have data that's missing or incomplete, you can transfigure it to what you need it to be. Add rigor to your JSON data. What do I mean by this? Well, about two and a half years ago, I became aware of the jsonschema.org folks. And what they came up with an idea is that if you have a JSON document, you can actually define what parameters you want to go uh, in that data before you put it into the database. Now, in this example here, we're gonna have a document that has our parameters. That's the one in the middle. We're gonna say that we're gonna have a object and its properties is its name's gonna be my age. The value has to be a numer number. The minimum value is 28, the maximum number is 99. And then when we, you know, we have our data, which there you can see where the, the uh, key is my age and the value is 33. Now, when we run that, it comes back and signals us with a one that is does valid, valid. So 33 does fit between the range and we do have a column named my age. 
Now where this comes in handy is you can put it into a constraint check. In this case, uh, we're taking the same um, exemplar document that we have, now we'll put it in the, inside the check. And we've also added required. So if the data does not have that in there, the server will reject that data. So if you're trying to get my age or you're trying to get uh, a valid VIN number or some other piece of data that's vital, you can actually make it required. Now, the two examples I here, have here, first one we're trying to put in someone who's under the minimum limit and it comes back and it will tell you that the check constraint, my age and range is violated. And if we run it the second time, the data actually goes in, you can see it's okay, query okay, one row affected, it's actually put in the data. So you can keep out the bad data before it even gets written to the disk. Now another, um, another function came out at the same time as JSON schema validation report. What's really nice about this is that it formalizes the output and in this case, it's coming back and telling us that the, uh, the document did not get into the database and why. And in this case, it says the JSON document and location my age failed requirement minimum and gives you the, uh, the rest of the specifications. Now, some recommendations for those of you who are gonna use JSON and I listed these from the Postgres manual. Representing data as JSON can be considerably more flexible than traditional relational model, which is compelling environments where requirements are often fluid. This still does not mean that you can just violate all the rules out there. It's possible to have both approaches working side by side, but you have to be careful. Now, where you need most maximum flexibility, it's still recommended that you keep some structure to your JSON documents, have required fields out there so that you can use it with SQL processing. Now, as the structure is kind of loosey-goosey, it helps to still have a predicate of what you want out there so that you uh, at least get the, the data you need. Now, you still have the rules of MySQL behind you. Uh, if you're running uh, any consistent level, it's gonna be the same for the JSON data as it is for anything else out there. It's still gonna follow what the server does. And true, you can put large documents in there, but keep in mind that the, more, the bigger things you put in there, uh, the more nasty it is to rewrite it or update it. Now consider limiting JSON documents to a manageable size to decrease lock contention. You don't want to uh, shoot yourself in the foot there. Now ideally JSON documents that each represent an atomic datum that business rules cannot uh, dictate, cannot reasonably be further subdivided. So still keep the rules of normalization. So quick wrap up. Yes, use JSON in your relational databases. For speed, put it into a relational column. Plan your schemas on how you want to use the data. Use JSON table to temporarily make unstructured data structured. Use generated columns to materialize JSON data into structured columns until you can rewrite your app application to follow the first rule there. Uh, do not use JSON as a junk drawer or an excuse on your lack of planning. Do not overly embed your data in JSON documents. You'll see people on Stack Overflow who have stuff that are so convoluted you can't figure out how it goes, but they still want to parse it. And also do not use JSON to break general normalization rules or reinvent the wheel. And with that, I'd like to in invite you to Percona Live. It's May 22nd, 24th at Denver, at the Denver Marriott. We're speaking open source databases and their environments. And with that, I wanna thank you. Uh, if you go out to speakerdeck.com slash stoker, you'll find a, a version of these slides. There's a lot of stuff I left out for time constraints. Well, with that, that's it. Thank you very much and have a good show.